Digital Book Salon. My name is Michael Bush, and I'm the Director of Public Programs at the Polis Project. Today, we're pleased to be joined by the University of Colorado Denver's Dr. Brandon Mills, author of The World Colonization Made, The Racial Geography of Early American Empire, recently published by the University of Pennsylvania Press, which we're gonna be discussing today. Um, before we begin, uh, just a brief note to our audience. Uh, part of the goal here is to stimulate an actual book event, which means that to the extent possible, we're gonna try to make this an interactive event with our audience. So if you have a question as we move along for our guest, please send it along to the Polis Project Twitter account, which can be accessed at project underscore Polis and uh, time permitting, we will ask it. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. Uh, Brandon, welcome to the Polis Project Digital Book Salon. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and have a chance to share my work with the community. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the book is terrific. Uh, congratulations on it. And Thanks. so the, the, the book chronicles uh, the rise and fall of the American colonization movement as a political force within the United States. And you locate the advent of the American colonization, or I should say American colonizationism in the revolutionary period, right at war's end. Can you begin by talking about what American colonial ambition looked like in those early stages, the mm -hmm. motivations that animated it, and the kinds of proposals that were being uh, made by those advocates? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when we think of colonizationism, which is a term I use throughout the book and, um, and was used by contemporaries at the time to refer to basically a set of ideas which was um, aimed at creating colonies of African Americans, uh, both inside and outside US borders. And colonizationism is usually associated with Africa or, um, or uh, the, in particular, the colony of Liberia, which we'll get to in a moment. But really what I want to start my book with was the point in which you're talking about is this post-revolutionary era in which we see a lot of different types of colonies discussed. Um, in, in a sense, this is colonizationism before there's any kind of movement to organize those ideas. Um, and that's to say these, these plans were very vague, ill-defined, um, kind of all over the place, but also being prominently um, advocated by people like Thomas Jefferson and uh, James Monroe. And what is, I think, really important about framing the beginning of that story of colonizationism there, um, rather than in Africa, is that most of these early colonial proposals focused on North America, not Africa. Um, there were a handful of people interested in Sierra Leone, which is a British colony, and other colonies in Africa, but many of the proposals are very notably um, aimed at parts of North America that either the U.S. had already colonized or had designs on um, having some relationship with, on, uh, uh, in, with colonizing uh, the indigenous lands uh, in the West. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really important to think about that because it's really situating the colonization movement within the United States' own evolving conception of itself as an empire. Um, and that we see the fact that these colonies that are proposed during this period are really spanning um, continental territory that would either um, become claimed by the United States or other parts um, of, of, of North America, um, which includes places like the what is now parts of the Midwest, um, parts of the Louisiana territory or Missouri territories further west, and even um, even further far farther than that, places like the Rocky Mountain region and, and California, all those places eventually would come to be claimed by the United States on indigenous lands. But we can see in these colonies that are being proposed during this period of time, kind of wide ranging um, fantasies of a different racial, racial geography for the United States um, empire within North America, which is to say, it included some kind of place for black settler colonies alongside white settler colonies, even if many um, whites who imagined these colonies, and it was primarily um, white Americans who were advocating for such colonies, that they were imagining these in very provisional and circumscribed terms. They were not fully independent. They were very often seen as appendages of the U.S. state in some way or loosely affiliated or connected with it. But it does present a kind of radically different vision of how the United States would be arranged. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about that. But the other crucial thing I, I wanted to just touch on that was um, that was hinted by your question was the broader context for this, which is, I think, um, crucial to establish uh, 
This was a context of what I would I refer to in the book as counter-revolution, which is to say, particularly the imprint of the Haitian Revolution um, in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, um, which was an uprising led by slaves and free people of color in Saint-Domingue that unleashed fears in the United States and really around the world about the autonomy um, of enslaved people and, and revolutionary actions on behalf of ending slavery and establishing a republic um, that would end slavery. Um, and, and we see almost every colonization proposal imagined during this period of time was in, written in some ways in response to that. And, the, and I think the idea was that, um, that whites thought that they could foster and manage colonies as, as a way to kind of control these, these forces of republicanism that they saw unleashed in Haiti in a context in which they um, had a greater degree of kind of say over the terms of that. Um, and so I think th those are really crucial to understand, both the, the broader context of U.S. empire being very open-ended at that moment and the, the kind of concerns about republicanism. And what did these proposals look like? Uh, what, what were some of the ideas that were bandied, bandied about at this point in time? So some of them um, were imagined to be um, basically um, colonies that would cr be created on native lands, and it was very unclear how that would take place, whether it would be through military dispossession or whether it would be through some kind of treaty process with native peoples. But, um, but basically it would be planted on those lands that in some cases were claimed by other empires. So you have some people looking to what becomes eventually part of the United States in Louisiana territory when it's still part of the Spanish empire, for instance, and saying that colonies could be planted on other, the territorial claims made by other European empires. In other cases, um, there, there was more of a defined sense that these colonies would um, be autonomous for a period of time and that, Af that, that kind of white administrators would help foster African-Americans to build Republican institutions and that either those would become independent republics in and of themselves that would be kind of affiliated um, American republics or that they would eventually kind of graduate to U.S. statehood and go through a territorial process. Um, and, and, but this was planted way in the distant future. You know, people were thinking in terms of 50 or 100 years in the future. And very often we see these planted further and further from the frontiers of where white settlement is happening. Um, many whites imagining that they wouldn't reach those, um, colonizing those territories further in the West in places like California um, until much later. So, they're, they're, they're really not a kind of clear kind of set of coherent ideas animating them. There's a lot of different kind of um, general uh, ideas animating them. But the, the point is that they're all kind of, in, in a sense, trying to reproduce a, a model of U.S. settler colonialism, but imagining it within a context in which these would be some way aligned with the United States control of the continent. That essentially the, whatever resulted, whether it be an autonomous nation whether it become a state of the United States in some way, that would be fostering the United States um, uh, dominance within North America. Yeah. You know, one of the uh, the sort of centerpieces of the anchor of the book in many respects, I think, is the, the sort of the rise and, and your examination of the American Colonization Society, uh, which emerged, as you demonstrate, as a major force within American politics. And this was something I, I wasn't aware of at all, to be perfectly frank. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the ACS was uh, mm -hmm. and how its vision of American colonialism uh, differed from those earlier ideas that you were just discussing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and the American Colonization Society is, is kind of an interesting organization because it's really, as I talked about a moment ago, there's all these kind of vague ideas floating around in a sense um, in this post-revolutionary area. And then the American Colonization Society becomes this first and really dominant over the entire antebellum era organization committed to this idea. And it really becomes synonymous with colonizationism for the most part, even though there are lots, there remain ideas floating around. And what it is, is a kind of a strange beast. It's, it's, it's a movement organization in the sense that it's trying, it's a reform movement it's affiliated to some extent with the, the um, Second Great Awakening and religious reform efforts. It gets a lot of support from evangelical ministers, um, but it's most decidedly not a grassroots movement. Um, and it almost appears kind of overnight. Um, it's, it's first it, um, uh, meetings are in the halls of Congress um, and led by prominent white politicians, kind of a who's who of, of politicians of the time. 
from Henry Clay and Daniel Webster to the um, Supreme Court Justice and nephew of George Washington, Bushrod Washington, who becomes the kind of first president of the organization that is in some ways giving this kind of nationalist imprint tour on the organization. And so it's really not a bottom up, it's really extremely top down. It's kind of fostered the halls of power. And as such, it has a dominant influence on the discourse about this, this idea um, that, you know, prominent people like Jefferson and Monroe have been talking about this, but suddenly it's it has more sway in Congress and ultimately gets um, legislation passed that helps support it. And the way I kind of look at the, the movement a little bit differently than other kind of histories of this um, is to say, I'm not explicitly focused on the, the travails of that organization, the ups and downs of it. And many people kind of start their histories of colonizationism with that, that, um, that organization that trace its various kind of tendrils into auxiliaries in different states and the, um, the financial woes of the organization, which go down in the 1930s or the 1830s, et cetera. And I'm less situated on that as a kind of focus of my work in trying to think about like what this organization does in or in kind of um, consolidating and directing and in a way redirecting all that ferment that we see around colonizationism in the post-revolutionary era um, and ultimately shifts um, pretty quickly to an almost exclusive focus on Africa um, West Africa in particular as the site for a potential colony of the United States. And what I, I argue in the book um, that to your question about how it represents a different vision of colonialism is that it, it reformulates many of the ideas that have been circulating around, but thinks of them not in terms of being a, an extension of the United States settler empire, not in the idea that either these colonies would be a vaguely affiliated settler societies or that they would ultimately be absorbed into the United States empire um, within North America, but that it would be some kind of reproduction of the United States empire. Um, and that, and in quickly after the organization is formed, people start speaking of a United States of Africa as being the goal of what this organization was trying to advance. Um, and so what we see is at that moment, we have a, a bifurcation that this is aligning with a vision on one hand of expansive North American colonization. I mean, um, the, the, the visions of a, a North American empire only accelerate during this era, but that's one that is more or less exclu exclusively reserved for white settlement with black slaves um, being in the, in the, the, the slave uh, colonies that are created um, and inaugurates in many ways a different kind of vision of empire, I think, that's reflected within the colony itself, which is that, that this United States of Africa would be some kind of reproduction of the U.S. that would have some alignment with it but that ultimately would never be considered to be part of the United States territorial empire. That um, there, there's a set of kind of, um, kind of arcane constitutional debates about whether it's even within the purview of the United States to have overseas colonies and how those are distinct from continental empire. And really they come down on the idea that this should be a completely separate entity. It should not be, for instance, incorporated into the territorial processes, become a U.S. state, et cetera. And that's not quite what was being imagined for those earlier colonies, as ill-defined as they were. Um, and so I think we see a real transition moment in the way the colonization society is framing this issue. To this a moment ago, but, you know, you, you talk in the book about how you know, this United States of Africa kind of blended seamlessly with the anti-colonial imperial foreign policy that, that was sort of taking hold in Washington during that period of time. And, it, you know, as part of that is this, this notion of, of mm -hmm. racial republicanism, um, which, which you spend a lot of time uh, dealing with in the book. And so I'm wondering if you could continue to unpack that a little bit more, this, this idea of kind of anti-colonial imperial project uh, of the United States, uh, which, you know, I, I think isn't immediately uh, obvious. Um, and talk a little bit about how this notion of racial republicanism um, really does begin to define America's fledgling sense of imperial ambition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, what I was trying to do in the section of the book where I, I refer to what you're talking about, which is frame an, a kind of anti-imperial, or sorry, anti-colonial imperial foreign policy ethos for the U.S. is really coming in the context of talking about the Monroe Doctrine, particularly. Um, and the Re Monroe Doctrine, of course, becomes a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy over the course of the 19th and 20th century. And it's, it has its roots really during this administration of, of James Monroe 
that also established the colony. In fact, the capital Liberia is named after James Monroe, Monrovia. Um, and so it's coming at this exact same moment. And there's not a lot of evidence of absolutely direct kind of influence there. But what I wanted to, to think about is the, the, the broader kind of foreign policy and rhetoric, uh, uh, the context of rhetoric that's coming about at that time. And the Monroe Doctrine, um, if you might recall, is aimed at preventing European inf interference into the independent republics in, in the Americas. So we have many of the independence movements co coming about in parts of Latin America against the Spanish Empire during this period of time. And there was concern that European empires might try to recolonize those, those regions. And so the U.S. was kind of asserting a, a kind of nominal support for those republics, even as it tried to keep an arm's length away from them. I, with the idea that those republics were essentially should be protected um, to, to some extent or preserved from um, European interference. But it, this also, over time, lays the groundwork for the United States um, kind of implicit imperial vision of itself as the dominant power within the Western Hemisphere. And, and this would be expanded in later foreign policy doctrines by the U.S. that it reserved the right itself to interfere um, in the affairs of, of parts of Latin America and the Caribbean, um, but did not um, uh, uh, allow that right or, or claim to not allow that right for, for other European empires. Of course, the Monroe Doctrine was coming at a time where the U.S. was very weak and couldn't really enforce this idea. Um, but what I'm latching on to here is the idea that it was, in a sense, supporting a, a, a sense of, of nominal um, republicanism and independence for those, those countries, but also assuming a, a kind of right of, of, of oversight or control over those regions. And the term that I use in the book to, to refer to the set of ideas that consolidate around Liberia is racial republicanism, as you referenced. And what I'm trying to do with that is kind of put that in that idea in the broader foreign policy context I just talked about, which is to show that, you know, the ways that this movement to create a colony in Liberia we're really trying to reconcile both a deep commitment in the United States to Republican ideals and self-government and wed that to a kind of main maintenance of, or even acceleration of racial hierarchies to accentuate kind of different Republican governances under different racial regimes. And so, um, so this ostensibly kind of admits the possibility of black self-governance. Um, it's, it's saying that African-Americans could eventually perhaps govern themselves within um, these republics that are, that are being imagined, but really only under the political con conditions that were deemed appropriate by whites. Um, and so, you know, despite this kind of nominal support for, for black autonomy within the colonies, I, I'm really arguing that what most American, white Americans who supported the colonization movement were most concerned with though was constructing their own version of a racial republic, their own white racial republic, right? So. So the idea of creating non-white racial republics um, that were organized around race um, and distinguished from each other was ultimately kind of in service of this broader goal of, of justifying and establishing a white republic in the United States. You know, one of the things that, that you do in the book is, you know, we, we look to the Liberian Project, uh, but then you yeah. also kind of scan back to what's going on on the, the proverbial home front, uh, where the United States is in the middle of pursuing its policy of, of Indian or, or Native American removal. Uh, mm -hmm. I argue that the colonizationist project influenced the direction, actually, of federal Indian policy. Can you talk about what that looks like and, and why advocates uh, for Native American settler colonialism uh, sought to incorporate non-white populations into their sort of racial mm -hmm. republicanist project? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what you see really in, in this period of time, and particularly in the 1820s, is that the, the acceleration of discussion of colony for Liberia, Liberia's founded um, in the early 1820s, and the colonization movement is kind of ascendant during that period of time. And that's happening at a time when there's a lot of discussion about um, colonizing indigenous lands in the West and how, um, how in what ways indigenous people might be removed from those territories to facilitate colonization. And because those conversations are happening at the same time, you see a lot of overlap and cross pollination or pollination of those ideas of, of colonizationism. Um, and in the 1820s, colonizationism as a, as a word was actually referred to both Native Americans and African Americans. 
And there were some examples of activists like the um, Baptist minister, Isaac McCoy, who was really prominent in advocating a colony in the West that would, in his mind, bring together many indigenous nations um, uh, from the East where they were being removed and create a kind of pan Indian Republic that would be permanently established in the, in the West. And that would kind of look similar to Liberia in terms of how he was conceived. And he was also a supporter of Liberia and many of the advocates of, of so-called Indian colonization um, were also supporters of, of the ACS. And so what I'm trying to show in, in this chapter is that these were really linked conceptually and in some senses very directly, but we can also see how they met kind of different fates um, uh, for, for what, um, what they resulted in federal policy and that we see the federal policy for um, Indian removal really advances, particularly in the Jacksonian era, um, but does but really kind of discards a lot of the kind of um, the 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 purportedly benevolent ethos of of the the um, McCoy figures who were saying that this could be a colony where um, where we can kind of imagine this utopian um, racial republic of of the kind that we see in Liberia, and it really becomes uh, an execution of raw force. Um, the other, in the other case, we see colonizationism in, in Liberia not um, being pursued um, at, on a federal level to a large extent. But the military helped establish the colony of Liberia and the nav Navy as part of patrolling the slave trade, but it really didn't have a direct role in administering and supporting the colony and did not appropriate a lot of funds towards it. Thus, there was a push to, to do that, and it doesn't happen. And so we see... We can see in that different kind of registers of U.S. empire happening where you have one that is really advanced at territorial acquisition um, that is essentially um, supported in, in the case of some version of Indian colonizationism that becomes removal policy, um, whereas colonization policy does not materialize. And many are making arguments that this is this is too far for the U.S. to imagine itself projecting overseas, that it shouldn't. It's a overstep of state power. And there's a lot of kind of anti-federal um, Jacksonian arguments playing in there. But essentially, they're both conceived within this kind of broader scope of U.S. empire. Um, but we're seeing a redrawing of lines between kind of versions of continental and overseas expansionism within within those movements. And I think it's, it's really important to kind of think about those paired together as conceptual ideas um, um, because of their many linkages, but also because of these divergences we see between them. Yeah. You know, by, by the 1840s, you know, support for the idea that Liberia should serve as a military or a commercial outpost of the United States has mostly fallen flat. Um, and in its wake, you show that there's an argument uh, that takes hold for Liberian independence. Can you talk about what this change in colonizationist thinking uh, tells mm -hmm. us about how the United States saw itself internationally during this period of the 19th century? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very kind of um, resonant moment that I want to focus on in the book of, Mo of Liberian independence in 1847. Um, and Liberia, of course, was, like I said just a moment ago, not a colony of the United States and really kind of had this ambiguous, somewhat ambiguous relationship with the U.S. federal state, but it was a function of a private organization in the U.S., which is the American Colonization Society. So there's a kind of complex process I go in the book that by which the settlers themselves decide to declare independence and the ACS eventually comes to support this. Mm -hmm. And it declares itself to be the Republic of Liberia in 1847 and, and kind of um, sidelines the white leadership of the American Colonization Society um, movement in doing so and the black settlers in, in the colony kind of create this um, uh, republic. And what I focus on in the book in terms of what you're asking in terms of how we think about the U.S. conceiving of this republic is that there's a lot of symbolic significance kind of freighted um, onto this 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 moment of, of independence. Um, and for white colonizationists, it function in a few different ways. Um, one on one hand, it allowed them to claim that African Americans could technically become citizens of a republic elsewhere. And, and this, uh, as I point out in the book, really bolsters the kind of exclusionary laws we see taking place, particularly in parts of the Midwest, where African-Americans are um, increasingly excluded in direct ways from any kind of citizenship rights in what are free um, northern states. And so it's, it's, it's serving to, to really say, like, well, 
African Americans can't have rights here, but they can have rights elsewhere. Um, and 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 again, pointing to the idea that the, the kind of fundamental goal was establishing a white um, republic in the U.S. But the other thing that it does, I think, that is important to looking forward in terms of the thinking of empire that it represents is that it seemed to validate the idea um, or it, it was being claimed to validate the idea that the U.S. could advance its power or its influence abroad by projecting its political, economic, cultural institutions into a place like Liberia to be to realizing what had been imagined by the, the early um, colonization movement that this could become a United States of Africa, right? And so there, there is an idea that it, a kind of in germination, it's really kind of a projection. There's not very little US control over it. And in fact, as you mentioned, even the efforts to use this as a military economic outpost are very kind of circumscribed and not um, particularly well developed during this period. But what I'm emphasizing here is the way that, that it kind of generates a set of ideas and discussions about what that means, what it means for the US to um, engineer a republic abroad and claim some kind of ownership over that place. Um, for free African Americans in the US though, it had a very different set of uh, meanings that were in many ways even more complex and fraught. Um, and something we haven't touched on yet that I want to mention is that by and large, African-Americans really opposed um, the colonization movement from its inception. There were some advocates of the movement and some wanted more black led versions of this that would um, that would realize a kind of a, a colony. But more or less, they, they very quickly re recognized the kind of racist assumptions of the movement and, and protested against the American Colonization Society as it's created. And. But during this period of independence, we see people beginning to reconsider it as a possible um, destination. Some African Americans say, well, this is the world's second black republic after Haiti, and that we should support it and perhaps emigrate to it, particularly at a time in which um, the situation, the racial situation in the US is worsening, things like the Fugitive Slave Act. And But what we see in that moment is we do have a, a kind of pushback against that by many um, in, in black political conventions during this period of time that are considering this question. Um, and many vociferously kind of continue to argue, argue against this and say that, you know, even though it's claiming it's independence, this is a false vision of independence and autonomy. Um, and it and ultimately has served to worsen the position of African-Americans in the U.S. So that so many black audiences um, uh, don't support it. But it's it has this kind of complex um, uh, set of reactions by both white and audiences and black audiences that we see at that particular moment. Yeah, I, I, I you've sort of touched on this a little bit already, but I want to return to this question of Liberia on the one hand versus versus Haitian independence, mm -hmm. um, and and you know what's what's true and during this period, as far as I'm aware, is that to a large degree Haiti's independence was not uh, formally recognized. Yeah. Uh, by the United States in any sort of meaningful measure. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this notion of independence and, and how um, and to what extent, I guess, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the willingness to recognize uh, yeah. Syria um, is is the result of the fact that of the sort of the incorporation of the uh, of the institutions that you remarked on before. In other words, yeah. like you square in the colonist imagination, the colonizationist imagination, excuse me, uh, the refusal to to think about Haiti uh, and yeah. the embrace of Liberian independence. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a really striking and rich contrast, and really Haiti um, at, kind of serves as a con consistent backdrop throughout the book. As I mentioned, it comes up in the earliest proposals for colonies. It surfaces at different moments, in which, particularly when the colonization movement is being pitched, um, some people are arguing, well, African-Americans should migrate to Haiti. And the colonization movement really kind of tries to push that aside, say, no, it should be Africa and Liberia. And But as you mentioned, the question of recognition is really important in the 1840s because um, at that moment, of course, Liberia, uh, Haiti had existed for uh, more than 40 years, had gone unrecognized as a republic by the United States while the US had recognized other republics in, in the Americas and in, in Latin America. And of course it had been done so um, because or had been refused to be recognized largely because of slaveholder power within Congress, um, that, that any attempt to recognize um, Haiti would be a recognition of the ability of African Americans to govern themselves and would be an implicit kind of endorsement of the anti-slavery government um, established by Haiti, right? Um, and, and then this even played into questions about recognizing other Latin American republics in which enslaved peoples had played a part in their revolutions as well. 
Um, but the, that, that factor of slaveholder power within Congress really plays into the fact that neither Haiti nor Liberia are recognized. Um, and it's not until the Civil War that I mentioned at the end of the book that this that context is gone and that, it, that both are able to be established. But I think what is interesting in the question that you raise is um, Haiti um, is not, e even though it's, it's largely the fact of slaveholders um, opposing it within Congress that it doesn't get diplomatic recognition, there's really very few people in the U.S. that are pushing for its recognition or, or trying to acknowledge it other than kind of the more radical edge of abolitionists. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have black abolitionists um, and black leaders in the U.S. pushing for Haiti, but, um, and you have a handful of more radical white abolitionists, but for, by and large, many are not saying, well, we should also recognize Haiti. Liberia, on the other hand, does, um, after this moment, have an advocate, uh, a base of advocates. And we see a lot of kind of um, pushes for Congress to, to do this in the 1850s. And, and what I, I argue in the book that, that it, it the reason for this primarily is that it presented a vision of black self-governance that in a sense appealed to whites um, and that it reflected U.S. institutions. There was a lot of focus in the early coverage after independence that it had um, a constitution and a structure of government that looked a lot like the United States, that it based its flag on the United States, et cetera. Um, but it also, I think crucially that it was established through non-revolutionary means. Um, it was not established through a slave revolt and, and a revolutionary, uh, prolonged revolutionary struggle, but through this process by which the U.S. kind of assumed a role in managing it. And then finally, it was seen at least in some way to potentially be a proxy for U.S. interests because it reflected its institutions. That, it, that um, Haiti was, it's, it had a very autonomous kind of nature um, and, and, and the U.S. perhaps could have greater um, control or oversight over, uh, over an independent um, Liberia than it would ever Haiti. And so I think the, all those factors play into the fact that there is a concerted effort to recognize it, even though, as I mentioned, they both don't get recognized. Mm -hmm. um, but returning to black activists that I mentioned a moment ago, um, I think it's, it's, also, um, it's also worth thinking about the fact that um, they are responding to both of these republics simultaneously as well. And many of them point to that contrast um, very pointedly. In fact, point out that all these whites are clamoring to uphold Liberia and, and, and yet um, not really making calls to recognize um, Haiti. Um, and, and they do this to kind of point out what they think many think is the fundamental inadequacy of Liberia as a kind of independent um, re black republic. Uh, Martin Delaney, the black abolitionist, famously calls it a burlesque on a republic. And this, in some ways, this contrast flattens the actual politics of what are going on in Haiti, which is a very kind of contentious uh, internal politics um, that, that make it, you know, not easily digestible. But, me but the point is that it's um, black audiences are res responding to the fact that Haiti's uh, independence was rooted both in uh, explicit abolitionism and anti-colonialism and an assertion of black self-governance, whereas we have this much more complicated story for a place like Liberia. Yeah. I'll, I'll <clears throat> shift gears for just a moment and, and yeah. talk about the, the role of gender in all of this. Yeah. You know, while, while you mentioned that support from Black Americans for the Liberian Project was, was decidedly mixed, you, uh, you also note uh, that the prospect of Liberian settlement appealed some, uh, to some of the aspiring settlers themselves, their mm -hmm. sense of masculinity and, and its connections with notions of redemption. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about how these tropes manifested themselves during this period and informed the debate over bla Black settler colonialism in Africa. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And and I think that it's important to think about all these questions that we just talked about a moment ago of independence and the meaning that are attached to a black republic, because they're often very much linked um, in 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 distinct ways to to issues of gender. Um, and I think a way one way to think about this, the context of this is um, that in the early 19th century US, we have this advancing kind of tide of universal white male suffrage in which property restrictions from the revolutionary period on are gradually um, uh, uh, eliminated within many states. And, and so Republican citizenship in the United States becomes defined around a, a kind of racialized masculinity. Um, and that was often linked to settlement, um, to the idea of uh, men 
being the kind of uh, the progenitors of settlement on Native American lands in the West. And what we see of, of among African Americans is that in conjunction with the colonization movement, and very often in explicit ways, African Americans are denied both from citizenship and settlement um, on, on Native lands. Um, and this was taking place through restrictions in um, free, uh, the so-called free states um, that I mentioned um, a moment ago that instituted laws that, that tried to disenfranchise African Americans from any kind of semblance of citizenship rights, not only voting, but service on juries, but also even from settling into states, coming into states and establishing themselves as even residents of those political communities. Um, and so not to mention, of course, the, the fact that half of the United States were composed of slave states in which um, African Americans had no rights whatsoever. So both of those factors are serving to undermine, um, in a sense, the, that sense of kind of masculine citizenship that had been asserted as a kind of foundation cornerstone of the United States um, democracy by that period of time. And so we see some black male audiences responding to that kind of with a rhetoric of redemption um, in the possibility of participating in a black republic through which they could reclaim that loss of the ability both to become citizens and to settle um, new territory. And we can see this evident in the writings by many black um, male leaders, as well as letters that were written to the ACS by people who wanted to go to Liberia, who were black aspirants to become settlers. And they we see them um, linking these um, these ways in, in a kind of gendered rhetoric or vision of national independence in Liberia. Um, they were linking it to physical kind of masculine labor and agriculture and commerce that they would do to kind of build up the, um, the economy of the nation through kind of the idea of manly kind of civic participation and political processes um, uh, as voters or becoming um, representatives as, as a senator or, or a, a house member or through the action of, of manly actions of military service that were essential to maintaining a colony that was colonized on indigenous lands in West Africa. And so we see that that kind of tension playing out, um, and we, we we often see it playing out in the black press. There are a number of black and abolitionist newspapers in which um, activists and writers are, are writing on these questions. And I highlight one in particular in my book um, between Augustus Washington, who is a supporter of colonization, and he kind of endorses this idea of a redemptive settler citizen in Liberia, um, aim, uh, kind of about reclaiming manhood and masculinity. Um, and he's countered by um, the famous black abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who, who argues that it's more manly in his mind to remain in the United States and overturn, work to overturn slavery there rather than um, realize it through um, this kind of process of colonizing. So there's a rich debate there within, uh, within black communities about the, the degree to which they were going to support this, and it very often plays into the question of gender. You know, following the American war with Mexico in the mm -hmm. 1840s, uh, Central America becomes a focal point for competing visions of American colonialism. Um, you know, I was I was aware of like the, the adventures of William Walker in Nicaragua and, mm -hmm. and other things, uh, but I was unaware of the broader context of colonial aspirations in the region, including the settlement of black colonies in Central America. Uh, before we get into that, uh, you spent some time talking about the filibustering uh, mm -hmm. efforts during this period. And I think that that, that, um, that term has a, a slightly different valence uh, today yeah. than, than. So can we just start by having you explain what the filibustering campaigns looked like in Latin America during that period? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, William Walker um, was a, a, an American who engaged in what was perhaps the most famous of these filibustering campaigns. And basically what it was, was a private military expedition um, outside US borders, um, particularly in parts of Latin America to establish some degree of control or colonization of those lands by, um, by Americans. Um, and so the intents varied in the different projects um, and the locations that they were, um, but they were um, almost always aimed at in some way creating um, either uh, installing governments that would be favorable to the United States or establishing a republic um, that would be favorable to the US or uh, essentially eventually aligning that territory to become part of the United States in some way. And, and those, they were aligned very much with slavery. William Walker famously goes to Nicaragua, 
and briefly um, has this kind of military um, uh, government there in which he reestablishes slavery where it had been overturned in the independence movements of, of Nicaragua. And, um, and many of, of those, um, those projects were aimed at extending slavery throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, looking at places like parts of Mexico, Cuba, um, and other parts of Central and South America. And Walker's was the most famous because it was at least briefly successful, but there were a lot of these, particularly coming in the wake of the U.S.-Mexico War um, and, and inspired by the, the idea of, of expanding U.S. territory into other parts of Latin America. So I think it's important to think about that as, as a kind of backdrop to all of what I'm kind of going to in the book, which is the movements that are happening shortly thereafter or kind of concurrently with these in the, the late 1850s which is that we see a kind of reimagination of colonizationism kind of one last time um, that ultimately results in the first federal colonization policy um, by the Lincoln administration during the Civil War. And, and in many ways, they're responding to the context that creates all this interest in Central and South America among the filibusters. Um, and the same, those were animated in many ways by extending the reach of slavery and implanting in, um, sla enslaved institutions in those regions. But more generally, it, the, the entire region was much uh, more attractive to U.S. audiences for a variety of reasons. It was seen as strategically essential um, to U.S. economic prosperity, to geopolitical um, uh, uh, maneuverings, particularly with respect to the British Empire and its attempt to, to um, intervene in, in Latin America. And what you see as a result is the, the focus on creating colonies in Central and South America during this period of time um, is really aimed at combining the racial republicanism we've seen evident in the, the movement to create Liberia, but doing so within a kind of context in which there's a much more direct economic focus to the, the kind of imperial agenda that's being advanced. Um, and this is being driven by a culture of travel writers, diplomats, entrepreneurs who were looking at things like building canals, railroads, ports, coaling stations, um, and seeing the region as a base for resource extraction, as in particular, I would say, as a stepping stone to kind of inter-oceanic transit. And that's what all the focus was on the canals. And eventually we see something like the Panama Canal emerging out of that much later. And part of that is, is the United States kind of looking forward to establishing a, a wider kind of global footprint and a global imperial presence that spans the Pacific Ocean, but also um, to wider reach in, in Latin America. And so if we think of that, that kind of set of visions that's animating uh, many of these colonies, it's, it's partially pitched at countering the slaveholders vision of empire, which was really to import the political economy of slavery into those regions. They, they often wanted to do some of these same projects, but they were more fixated on slavery, whereas we have this kind of different economic vision for potential black colonies that were created in Latin America um, um, under this different kind of ethos. Um, and so I, I kind of argue that within that context, what you have is two sort of competing visions of U.S. empire um, in the 1850s represented by filibusters and colonizationism. One is by whites committed to slavery um, and advancing slavery, and one um, to kind of ad advanced by whites who were envisioning an end to slavery at some point, even if they weren't um, abolitionists, they were, they thought there would be some eventual end to slavery. But both of these visions were seeking to harness racial hierarchies and difference to kind of establish U.S. hegemony in the Western Hemisphere, um, kind of under these different registers, I think. Yeah. I wanted to just go back uh, um, to something you said a moment ago, uh, because yeah. that, that uh, fascinated me, and that is, you mentioned the role of travel writers uh, mm -hmm. in this project. Um, and one of the things that you, you mentioned in passing, and spent a little bit of time talking about in the book, is kind of the role of, of travel writing generally to the Imperial Project. Can you talk just a little bit further about that? Because I think it's a really interesting and often overlooked uh, piece of the puzzle in all of this. Yeah, you have a kind of a number of these figures circulating in this period that are writing um, these really kind of mixed uh, documents um, that are there are Americans traveling to parts of Central and South America or the Caribbean and writing as as kind of um, we could say unscientific anthropologists, uh, very kind of trying to describe the culture, the landscape, and, and, and et cetera. 
And it's a mixture of purposes because some cases those writers are trying to speak to U.S. audiences about the idea that those, um, to, to just interpret those cultures of, that, that Americans have little awareness of. Um, in other cases, they're really trying, they're almost designed at boosting those regions as attractive investment opportunities that, you know, talking about the mineral composites of, of, of territories or um, parts of the region that might be favorable to planting a railroad, right? And what they're doing is, is kind of in this combined um, description of the landscape and the people um, kind of looking towards those places as, as places that the U.S. could act. Um, and, and very often doing so with, by imposing kind of cultural narratives um, on those places by saying, um, for instance, you know, the, the influence of the Catholic Church has this particular um, resonance within, within parts of Latin America, and thus um, the U.S. should approach diplomatically or economically approach the region in this way. Very often, of course, it, it's related to racial assumptions about the degree of of, of indigenous um, ancestry within the leadership or um, African ancestry in the leadership of these, of these places. And so you have all of this, this kind of anthropological kind of entrepreneurial lens um, focused on it. And that is in many ways, what's feeding a lot of these ideas that are, you know, the, the, the plans for colonies in this region were almost as ill formed as the early ones, but they were more focused because there was this whole robust industry of, of travel writers who were who were serving, serving these multiple roles. And then you had an audience of U.S. people who are looking at reading those writings and then are primed to say, oh, yeah, it does make sense to create a, a black colony in Latin America because I've heard about all of the opportunities there. Or, and, and the fascinating thing with the context of these colonies is that while African-Americans are seen within a U.S. context as being um, inferior and incapable of exhibiting Republican institutions within the United States, even though there's this assumption that they could do that um, elsewhere in places like Liberia, they're actually often positioned as superior to other parts of Latin America um, uh, because of their Americanness, that they, they were embodying American institutions and culture, and that even if, if the, um, those regions were populated by non-white peoples, um, African Americans were in fact superior because they they would they would build that connection. Um, so it's it's this kind of fascinating mix, and the, I would say it's very much enabled by that culture of travel writing that you refer to. So we are beginning to run a little short on time, uh, and so I wanted to you know to begin to bring the conversation to a close. You know, and mm -hmm. you your book uh, with Abraham Lincoln's establishment of diplomatic relations with both Liberia and Haiti. Um, mm -hmm. But by way of conclusion, sort of two things. One, can you talk about how this pivot point speaks to the evolving racial geography of U.S. imperial ambitions during this period? Mm -hmm. And then two, and this is maybe the, the, the more unfair question, to the extent possible, can you talk about what this history has to teach us about contemporary American mm -hmm. empire? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, those are very big questions and I'll try to answer them as best as I can, but the, the, the reason I kind of end with this, this moment of recognition of Haiti and Liberia is that, as I referenced, Haiti kind of serves as this backdrop to both kind of a reason for the colonization movement to establish itself and then this constant counterpoint. So I think it's really a resonant moment when you have the, the U.S. doing this basic symbolic act of diplomatic recognition of both of those as part of the same bill at the exact same moment. And in this context, in the Civil War, in which slaveholders are removed from, the, from Congress and that there is the opportunity to do this for the first time. So what I was trying to ask there is a little bit, what, is, what does it mean for the United States to accept those places as peer nations in some sense on the world stage, at least if that's the assumption of diplomatic recognition? And what I, I, I kind of touch on, I don't go into the congressional debate in deep um, uh, way in my book, but I, I offer a glimpse into that debate. And what I think is striking about it is that much of it focused on the notion that the commitment to US slavery had essentially hobbled US um, economic and geopolitical um, uh, opportunities in those places or exploitation of those places to put it more harshly. And really this, um, you have in many ways um, a reconfiguration after the, of people looking to the post slavery moment that Slavery hasn't been abolished, but it's the, the war is setting up the prospect that it might eventually end. Mm 
And you have empire looking a little bit differently, particularly when you had these, particularly in the 80, 1850s, competing visions of pro and um, a non-slavery empire. But then you have um, supporters of recognition in this congressional debate explicitly saying, we are not abandoning our notions of, of, of racism or non-white inferiority, um, but we're trying to think about how republicanism and racism can be reconciled on an international scale. And, and that's, of course, a project that had been central to the colonization movement since its inception. But it's fascinating to see it being worked out at this moment, um, particularly as Haiti, of course, had been this kind of spe this specter for so long. And now, finally, um, Americans are willing to admit it on, 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 in, in some sense on the same terms as Liberia. And what I try to argue in terms of the, the broader question that you mentioned of the geography of U.S. empire is that we see in this a rhetorical turn towards a U.S. global empire, which is in a sense that the U.S. could advance the idea that it was supporting representative governments around the world um, while making their status often provisional or subject to military, political, economic interventions, and very often premise those interventions on the idea that they were in some way racially um, different or, or inferior, right? And so that is a shift in terms of how it's, how those colonies were being conceived of in the early moments of, uh, that I talk about that the colonies are being pitched, but also um, the fact that Haiti, which had been a specter for so long, was now being admitted on the same terms as Liberia, that we see a different kind of rhetorical um, strategy for US empire, rather than one that is focused around just settling territory, incorporating into the United States, displacing populations, but that it, in fact, um, racial hierarchies can be harnessed on the international stage in this way. And, um, and this tension, I think, that is arising that I just mentioned a moment ago between the status of supporting those as nominally independent republics with the idea that that republicanism is always provisional, always um, subject to, to intervention, is a tension, I think, that really sets the template for going forward in a broad sense. Um, uh, I, I, I think I don't try to overdraw the conclusions we make here is that now that people are really looking back and saying, oh, we need to establish what we did in Liberia as we expand around the world, but that it really indicates or is an indice of that shifting um, uh, uh, thinking. And we can see it moving forward in the 19th century to places like Hawaii, where the U.S. is nominally supporting independence until it didn't, and then settled, um, incorporates it as a state. Um, the places like the Philippines, where the U.S. Is, it undermines Republican movements, but then continually holds out the prospect of, uh, of independence for a long time. And then you can see it in, particularly in parts of, of what becomes part of the Monroe Doctrine um, uh, uh, ideology of the Western Hemisphere and Central and South America and the Caribbean. Where in the early 20th century, the U.S. is constantly intervening in, in, in those governments, um, even while it preserves some kind of thin um, veil that it's, it, that it's trying to improve upon their Republican institutions. We can even look later to places like Vietnam and Iraq, where, where democracy is held up as some kind of goal or eventual goal. Um, and so what I try to do in the book is, is not to draw those, those linkages too strongly, but to really think about we, we can recognize the, the, the deep roots of that impulse within U.S. thinking, and in particular that we can see the domestic forms of racism against African Americans and Native Americans, and the processes of settler colonialism are not separate stories um, from, from that U.S. internationalist perspective, but deeply intertwined with that history. Yeah. So we are just about out of time, uh, but for those of you that are watching, we've been discussing uh, Dr. Brandon Mills's book, The World Colonization Made, the Racial Geography of Early American Empire, just out from the University of Pennsylvania Press. And the folks at the press have uh, kindly uh, offered a 30% discount plus free shipping to any of our project, our, our Polis Project uh, readers and audience members out there. We will be publishing the code uh, to take advantage of that discount on our, our website and putting it out on social media as well following today's event. Uh, but in the meantime, Brandon, thank you so much for giving us your time this afternoon. This was a fascinating and, and really beautifully nuanced conversation. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. And thank you all to everybody that's been watching. Uh, this has been the Polis Project Virtual Book Salon. Uh, thank you for giving us your time today, and we'll see you all again soon. Until then, be safe and have a great rest of the day.